Well, let me welcome all of you to uh, another edition of uh, Chat with Matt. The uh, purpose of uh, Chat with Matt is uh, to be very personal. Uh, we, uh, as many of you know, who read my newsletter every night, uh, I write like you're sitting across from me, and now uh, with Zoom, uh, you're literally sitting across from me. So we're going to have a lovely conversation today. We don't have a huge crowd, uh, so I hope uh, those of you who have questions will use the chat feature. Uh, my wife Peggy is uh, on board today, and she'll be monitoring uh, the questions, and uh, we'll have an opportunity to uh, pose them with Richard. Uh, just to give you a little background, uh, my wife and I have known Richard and his wife Judith uh, for about 10 years. Uh, we've gotten to be very good friends with them, and in keeping with uh, Judith's uh, and Richard's philosophy of creating we uh, during dinner, we've had just uh, a, a large number of very personal and engaging conversations, uh, which is what we're going to do today. So again, welcome to uh, chat with Matt. Uh, with, there, we have a pretty full schedule uh, over the next several days, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, be able to keep this going. So I'm going to uh, just I'm going to let Richard do his own introduction. I've found that uh, for the most part, uh, when I when somebody introduces me, they do a terrible job of it. So Richard will uh, just give us a few thoughts on who he is and how he does it. And Richard, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I appreciate Matt and Peggy inviting me to talk about conversational intelligence. Um, um, conversational intelligence is based on neuroscience and the type of chemicals that change the way your brain works and um, and so I noticed that Matt put a very nice background about me in the email that he sent out. And he's told, and he's told me about you and your backgrounds. And so what that really is, is opening up some transparency and creating trust a little bit, working to create some trust among us. So if you, what you really need to know is understand what goes on in your brain a little bit and I won't bore you with the neuroscience of that too much, but trust is really important to have good conversations. If we can't have trust among ourselves, and, I, and we're on the way to doing that, we're not gonna have productive conversations, we're not gonna be innovative, and we're not gonna be able to co-create. So Matt's introduction that he wrote to you in the email, and the fact that he gave you a little bit about me, has helped to increase our oxytocin. It's helped to, to release oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin, which are those feel-good hormones that cascade through our brain. And it creates us, it makes us start to work in our prefrontal cortex, which is up here. And the prefrontal cortex is called um, the executive brain or the orchestra leader of the brain. And then, and then trust resides there, but distrust resides in a different part of the brain which is called the limbic system. And the limbic system contains the amygdala and the amygdala stimulates the release of cortisol, testosterone and norepinephrine. So I know you've heard about fight and fight and fright and all of those things. It's a takeover when you're being challenged by something or other. And it's, it's just part of our evolutionary makeup. Let me tell you a story about a client of mine, which will talk, which will illustrate what can happen when you don't have trust. I have a client, uh, as Matt outlined, who's a major administrator of a mental institution um, in New York. And, and she, along with her fellow administrators, um, work with people with, with severe mental disorders. And most of the people live within the facility. However, because of the coronavirus issue that's going on in New York, and New York City specifically, um, the city has, has started to convert much of, their, much of their institute for beds with people with infectious diseases. And so there are beds in the hallway, there are beds in the conference rooms, there's beds in the lunchroom, and the whole institution has been changed. But these people really are psychologists um, or psychiatrists, and they really don't know how to work with infectious disease very well. And the state representative who controls all of the, all of the similar hospitals in the area 
came down and talked, wanted to talk to everyone about how they can work and, and, and get ideas about how they can work with people with now infectious diseases. And my client raised the issue that we don't have all the safety equipment that we need to work with these type of people, especially we don't have masks. And how can the state supply masks for us? And so the, the key administrator, and these, I have to, you have to understand these are very senior people, and yep. they understand the regulations that affect how this institution works. But the, the administrator pulls out the regulations and starts to read verbatim to them about why they don't get masks because the state doesn't, doesn't supply masks to people who work with severe mental illnesses. He doesn't say to them, look, I understand there's an issue. How can we work better together? Do you have any ideas how we can get around this and make it work? He just reads them. Hey, this is the way it is. Now, how do you think my client felt? What do you think happened to her mentally? What happened to her mentally was her amygdala fired, cortisol spewed through her brain, started to increase in her whole system, and she shut down. Now, she could have argued, but she's a psychologist, and so she has an understanding of how the brain works. And she shut down, and she just kept her mouth shut. And what happened was he triggered that fight-and-flight response within her. So she didn't say a word, but she was embarrassed. What do you think the other administrators did? Do you think they joined in any conversation after that? They said to themselves, we're not getting into this fight. And they backed out. And so it was a very short meeting. And yet the gist of that meeting never brought, never brought the subject matter to the fore. They never could discuss. He never built trust with them. He could never say to them, hey, what do you think? How do we do this? How can we work? Does anybody have any great ideas here? Let's talk about it. Let's bring it out on the table. He, doesn't, he didn't, even though they all knew each other, he didn't go forward with something that we call relationship before task. He wasn't transparent. He was just dictatorial. And so he shut down that meeting. There was no trust. And without trust, you can't have the type of conversations that you need to be co-creative, to be innovative, to come up with, with good ideas because your, your brain is not working that way. It's not open to allow you to do that. And so as communicators, and you're all, I guess you're in the financial networks, and you work for large corporations, or you work in um, well, financial we work, companies. If I can interrupt. We work for, oftentimes, mercurial people. Okay. Right? So um, I, I think to your point, that we've all worked for people who weren't aware that they were shutting down conversations. Right. And so the question that we have, as one communicators, is how do we break down those barriers, even with a leader or with an associate? I mean, look, we've been in meetings where you come up with a great idea and somebody says, hey, seen that before, been there, done that. That's not going to work. Sure. And, yeah. and all of a sudden, you go back into that protective, that protective shell and it shuts down conversation. Yeah. So, if I could just give you some sure. examples that you can elaborate on. Uh, when I when people um, and I have a conversation about networking, which is what we're our group is all about, uh, as my wife has explained to me, you have to ask open ended questions. Right. So, but to your point, if you ask somebody, do they know about any open jobs? People shut down. Oh, it's interesting. Because no one ever knows about any open jobs except for two weeks ago, and if only you'd call them. That's what they tell you. But of course, they actually have never heard about any open jobs. Right. On the other hand, if you start your conversation in a non-threatening way to not trigger that thing in the back of their brain, you put them, if you can put them at ease, people have a heat shield up, right? You're gonna ask them a question they can't answer. So if you ask them an easy question, right? Like, do you know any people who might understand my background? It generates a conversation. Right, in other words, you're asking questions that you don't have answers for. Right. And, what we're, and what we're doing with that type of approach is what we call level three conversations. Okay. So let me back down and tell yes, you about please. different levels of conversation that are, that, that are really set up to increase trust 
and 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 how you can reframe reframe as you just did how yeah. you can reframe conversations or refocus the conversation in a different way please so level level one conversations are transactional that's what you and i are doing that's what you and i just did okay I say something you say something we go back and forth in other words it's a tell it's an ask and and and, and it's for us to kind of for us to confirm what we know and so you confirmed okay. what your experience has given you and I confirmed you know, in, in the similar way what my experience has told me, okay? Sure. We can then move on from that into level two conversations. And level two conversations are positional. In other words, I state, I wanna tell you about conversational intelligence, and I think it's the greatest thing to slice white bread, because mm -hmm. it's, and I wanna tell you how effective it can be, and in fact, it's effective across different types of cultures because different peoples respond in different ways. So for example, in many cases in the United States, we always talk about making eye contact, but in yeah. other cultures, strong eye contact is really an insult. And so, and, on, and certainly in a, in a virtual setting, making eye contact is really hard to do. So sure, you know, there's, it's, it's just a, a real difference in that. So what level two is, I advocate something you inquire about it and we're still okay. We're still in building up trust. Where level two conversations fall apart. And I think you've seen this with CEOs that come into a large company right. where they have a great mandate to change it. And this right. is what we're gonna do and we're gonna move forward. We're gonna go after it as strong as we can. We're just gonna bang ahead. And then three months later, that mandate's not working. And so they, they go into what we, what many people call the tell and yell syndrome, right? They just ah, shout. Yell, I like that. Yeah, they just say it louder and louder. And what happens is it gets to you either on the bus or you're not on the bus. You either, you're either with me or you're against me. And that type of approach starts to build, starts to create stress and it doesn't work. Instead, and I think have, fact, should, when, when that starts, and, and when that starts happening, People shut down almost immediately when you start talking to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, and then there's another complex on that, and which I'll talk about in a second. Okay. But, but so you have to, you, we're just kind of trying to defend what we know and find out what you know and all of that. Level three is where, is where it's a transformational type of conversation. It's where I, we share and we discover. So I'm talking to you about conversational intelligence. You're talking to me about your work experience. Yeah. And so we're beginning to go back and forth. We're discovering what we don't know. In other words, your input, it becomes very valuable to me. Right. In effect, what we're doing at level three conversations is co-creating and creating trust. Now, on top of all of that, nine out of 10 conversations um, miss the mark. So let me read something. Let me read something to you. Please. Which I thought was very interesting. It, at one time, there was a Pentagon spokesman by the name of Robert McClowski. And huh. he was talking, he was talking to a number of reporters. And his comment was, I know that you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. And, sure. and I know you've probably heard that before. But the point of it is, that in the middle of a conversation, we space out. In other words, about every 18 seconds, our mind kind of goes somewhere, and then we come back into the conversation. And so one of the things we have to make sure we do all the time is listen to connect. Now, when we're in a, when we're, we're not virtual, we're in an open meeting, we observe a lot of things. We observe somebody who rolls their eyes, we observe, and different people take in information differently. So some people look up because they take in information visually. They create a picture mm -hmm. in their mind, which, 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 which kind of goes into their limbic system and relates to what their memories were. Other people's look down. And so we're aware of how people are taking in information. So conversational intelligence is all part of that. But in a virtual, in a virtual setting, that's very, very difficult to do. So we have to really remember that what's so important for us 
is to listen to connect and work on listening to connect what mm -hmm. the speaker is talking about. Because if we let our minds wander just for a few seconds, we've missed the context of that conversation going forward. Yeah. And so well, I, I would, I, what, what happens to me oftentimes is someone says something very interesting. Usually it's my wife, Peggy. <laughs> and, and my mind wanders for a few seconds because what she has said is very interesting. And I think of something that's connected to it. Right. Right. And I think we all do that. And, and at that point, I've missed something. Right. Right. And the, and, and the other thing that we do is many times we listen to a conversation, but we're really listening to what our comment is going to become next. In other sure. words, what do we say to that? And so we're, we're formulating our response and we miss the conversation. And so that's why yeah. it's very important. And then, of course, as, as we said, we have to build a relationship before task, because in the United States, it's always task before relationship, right? Here's right. the agenda. How do we move forward? How do we get this going? And yet, without building that relationship, we never establish the trust. And the other thing that we really I, need I think to that's do... A, if, I, if we can just stop for a moment... Oh, I'm sorry, I talked to... No, no, it, that's a big part of conversational intelligence is the uh, trust before task. And as Americans, we're very focused on getting the job done. Right, right. So we don't, we don't focus on the fact that e even within our own culture here, we have to build a degree of trust before anyone is going to participate in what we're trying to get them to do. That is correct. And so in, in a meeting that you might go to, you know, live meeting, you get there a little early, you shake hands with people who come in, you're right. building oxytocin, um, you're building that up in the body. Oxytocin, as I said before, is a trust, builds trust. Um, it's called the bonding hormone um, in the lay press. Yeah. So And so what you're doing is you're doing that in a virtual meeting. It's a lot more difficult to do. And you were kind enough to write that nice introduction down and tell people a little bit about me and a little bit about everyone. You told me a little bit about everyone else. And so all of these things are what's so important for us to go forward. So well, we, we, I'm, I interrupted me. we have so many tools today, this preparatory work that all of us should be doing is vitally important. Uh, I've sent out an announcement, sure, but when we're engaging in these virtual conversations where we can't shake hands, uh, we do have things like LinkedIn, where we can we should always look people up so we understand better where they're coming from. That's a very good point, sure. Yeah, it, because you have to understand people's backgrounds. And so like for, and I'll give you another example. Um, we did a lot of work uh, in, in the fashion industry, um, not exclusively, but we did work in the fashion industry. And Mary Wang, who had been working at Donna Karen, where we first met her, mm -hmm. um, ended up at Coach. And Coach was a company that was switching from, hey, this is our standard bag, this is what you get, yep. to being a fashion company. And if you walk around and you look at Coach stores, or when you were able to go into a department store and look at their displays, you realize there's a lot, one, there's a huge array of different bags and different styles. So Coach was in the midst of making a transition. So we went in and talked to Mary, and Mary said, I have to fire up my whole staff. Mm. They just don't get it, because these were the people that would walk in and say, hey, this is the bag this year, you wanna buy it? And the buyer would say, sure. But now they had to they had a convince they had to convince the retailer that that bag and, and their new approach mm -hmm. into the market was valuable for them. And, and so the first thing we did was we said to everyone, we set up meetings with Mary and we said to everyone, hey, look, you know, how, do you, how would you approach this problem? We opened it up. What is the ideas that you have? You know your customers better than we do. And Mary was an extraordinarily marketer, a great, great at it, and, and, and a retailer. And we say, or merchandiser is a better word. How do you, and we, so we opened up the conversation to include our whole staff. 
Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, the ideas about how to do this and how to do that and how to best approach Bloomingdale's and how to best approach Bergdorf and how to how do we really display what we put out and how do we work together? Mm -hmm. Everyone was involved in solving the issue in solving that problem. And then we did one other thing with Mary. Mm -hmm. We said, look, you're going to you're going to meet with Bergdorf next week and you have an agenda why don't you send the agenda to them up front and ask them, are there other topics they want to add to that agenda? In other words, pull them in. Make sure that they are participants rather than sending them something up front and having or talking about it when you get sure. there and having them have to respond. And so, and, and so we did that. And we also said to Mary, and make sure when you sit at the table, yeah. your people are not on one side of the table and the company's people are not on the other side of the table. Sure. Well, mix it up. And mix it up. One of the points that uh, I always make with people who are having conversations is uh, it, with groups is everyone wants to be heard. Right. And a lot of the people around in the room with uh, Mary originally would uh, probably no one ever asked their opinion before. Well, they're scared to death of her. Right. And, and she was a, she it's was a, a very great honor. Person. It's a great honor to be asked for your advice. She, Is it she, not? she was a pretty formidable little lady. I'm sure. I'm quite sure she's still a formidable little lady, but I haven't seen her in a, in a couple uh -huh. of years. People okay. who aren't don't get things done. They have to, <laughs> but they have, they have to know how to harness that energy. And well, I think to, uh, to your point, right. we're, we're going to be moving into a period of time in the next few months where everything will have changed to a degree unimaginable in my lifetime. Ways of doing business, ways of relating to people, whether you're in the office, whether you're not in the office. You know, they tried the work from home thing uh, many years ago and, you know, how did it work? But now all of a sudden, everybody's involved in that. And well, we you know, there's a lot of studies, interestingly enough, that are coming out about these um, open space offices. Yeah. Now, how, and how ineffective they have been. Oh, really? People, yeah, because people really need a little space of their own. They're open to talk to each other. Yeah. You also need a little place where you can belong. Where you can hide. I, I did work with Dexter Travenon, and, and they had this extraordinarily beautiful office outside of Chicago. And they had a designer come in, and we should all have offices like these people had offices. I mean... The tables were beautiful, but the designer wouldn't let anybody have any personal effects in their office. Really? And in fact, at night, he would go through and take them away if somebody had a picture of their family or of something else. So how do you think that made top executives feel? And I worked directly with their executive VP of medical affairs, who had worked in the government before he came to Baxter. And he had all these oriental rugs and everything else. And he just said, I'm going to quit unless you have my rugs in this office. Mm -hmm. And it created a big brouhaha. But the point of it was that nobody likes dictatorial type of approaches in relationships. We all want to, we all want to open up our relationship. Mm -hmm. And when we're aware of what goes on in our brain, even though we have an amygdala hijack, even though we're defensive, yeah. We can control that and we can understand and we can take a conversation like you've been doing and reframe it or yep. refocus it based on your experience. So reframing, refocusing and being aware. My wife, Judith, called it the third eye, that you're in the conversation, but you're watching the conversation at the same time. Yeah, and I, if, I think it, you, know, you're, you brought up an interesting point, but we, we don't really, we are animals and we, we don't change all that much as we grow older. Uh, everybody, to, to your point about the offices and having your own personal stuff around you, it's like your teddy bear when you were a small child, is it not? Well, it's the it's, same kind it, of comfort. Well, maybe it's like sleeping with more than one pillow. I don't know. So or Whatever it is. You, know. so you like to have all your stuff around you because yeah. it creates comfort. Right, it I actually placed the CFO at a job in, uh, at a not-for-profit, and they had a totally open office. Now, I honestly don't know how you could be a CFO and 
with papers on your desk, payroll and stuff, how you would ever manage from a privacy standpoint. But what he was telling me was they were just sitting all, they were supposed to move offices and they were all around these big tables and people around the tables were emailing each other. <laughs> I, I don't know how you got any work done. Yeah. And there well, are I'm conversations good. you can't have with everybody around. And that's the downfall of email as well, because you don't, it's very difficult. One, people don't reread what they write and you should always hold off be sending an email before you yeah, send it. For um, sure. So that's number one. But number two, it, it, it doesn't allow you to create that personal relationship that's necessary. Look, I have Zoom meetings. I've had four Zoom meetings already today. Uh -huh. And I Zoom with people in Australia, I Zoom with people in Croatia and parts of Europe, mm -hmm. people on the West Coast and, and Japan. Oh. So aside from the time differences, I, I, one, of, one of my associates is, lives in Hawaii. And so, you know, we have people up in the morning very, very early and people, I, like the other night, I had a, a Zoom meeting at nine o'clock at night with, with, a, with an associate in Australia or whatever time it was, because it was their morning. Yeah. And so we were able to connect with that. And so all of these factors come around in, in, trying, to, in trying to have that type of effective conversation that allows you to co-create and innovate. Everybody's and, on a different chemical balance if they're on different time zones, are they not? Well, you're in a difficult chemical balance. And by yeah. the way, cortisol is highest when you first wake up. So it gives you that circle forward. But you really have to be aware of the impact that you're having. Um, you were kind enough to mention conversational intelligence. This is not an sure. advertisement. But my wife, Judith, wrote three major bestsellers. One was called Creating We. Um, one was The DNA of Leadership. And Conversational Intelligence was the last of those. And Conversational Intelligence is now in its third printing. And conversational intelligence has been, has been reprinted in different languages. And so, oh, so interesting great. about that is that yeah. it's effective in different cultures. So we, we work with a marketing company in Mexico City. We have a, an ongoing relationship with a huge construction company in Guatemala. We work with a company in Australia. We've worked in Japan. I've worked with Fujisawa and I've worked with Takeda and so on. And yet, Con what I'm the, the the little brief outline that I've told you yeah. about conversational intelligence is effective in all of those cultures. And somebody once said to me, "Geez, the Japanese just oh, we were doing a, a, a worldwide work with um, AIG uh, through after um, I forgot his name, but we, we went through three CEOs in the period that we work with AIG globally." Uh -huh. And they license conversational intelligence for their for their whole company, and it went worldwide with all their with with all their subsidiaries around the world. And their comment to me was, "Geez, the Japanese just accepted it. That's great, you know, because they expected that type of pushback all the time." And yeah. so it's very effective, and 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 especially with leaders because leaders have to understand how to implement what they have going forward. Yeah, one, one of the things that um, I've, I've, I've read from a fellow by the name of John Locke was, uh, was the story of the change agent, you know, mm -hmm. they brought in to shake things up and right. the boss forgets to mention, as long as you don't upset anybody. <laughs> well, we work with you do whatever you want to do, but don't upset anybody. <laughs> okay, well, I'll give you a story about Exide. We were working with Exide, and the, the past president of Exide ended up in jail for 10 years for selling um, refabricated batteries through Sears as if they were new. Oh. So he went to jail for fraud. Oops. And Lutz came in, and Lutz had been, uh, he had been at Ford, and then he was the vice chairman of, cattle, of um, GM. And then is the one who revitalized the Cadillac market and everything else. He's a very ah. dynamic guy. Yeah. And he's brought in, he's brought into Exide to re revitalize Exide. And in those days, they had country managers. And he wanted to change the whole company 
over to a company that had product managers that operated worldwide because country managers were not as effective as they used to be and so forth. Okay. So no one who was a country manager, they have lots of power. No one wanted to give up their power. And so we put together a program um, that was called, let me serve you. And he brought all his senior people together. And here he was in a chef hat in an apron with a tray uh-huh. and walking around with hors d'oeuvres under that whole guide, under that, that whole title of let me serve you. And he started to talk to each one of these people and say, how does this work? How does this, how can we do this and how we can make it work? Some people quit but not everyone quit. People bought into that. And I'll give you one other story with Bristol Myers Squibb. We, we want to do some questions. We're, we've hit oh, 430 okay, actually. Because I can kind of ramble on a lot. No, so. we can keep talking. We'll see whether there's questions. Uh, if you all sorry, do, well, look to your chat box, if there's anything you want to say, or uh, if you want to unmute, you can ask a question. Otherwise, Richard and I are going to keep talking. We could keep talking for an hour. We can. Um, we may. <laughs> Okay. So let me tell you the story. Let me tell you the story about. Um, All right. So use your chat boxes, everybody. Okay. Bristol Myers Squibb. Over a few very, minutes. Very quickly, um, they had acquired a company for its technology, which happens in the pharmaceutical industry, um, pretty frequently. Uh huh. And and the, and so the chairman and the, the CEO of Bristol Myers Squibb stood in front of this audience um, of all the senior executives from both teams, and he says. You know, here we are to discuss how we work forward and move forward. How many people have you? How many people have you have been in meetings like this before? Everybody raised their hand. He said, "How many people have been in meetings like this before that you thought were successful?" Nobody raised their hand. <laughs> and he said, "Let me be transparent. These are some of the faults that I recognize in myself." And he listed the ten major faults that he has to work on to make this type of this type of acquisition work. And he said, I want everybody to go and think about the 10 things that you have to work on to make this acquisition work. And then we'll all get together tomorrow and we're gonna talk about what we can do to make ourselves more effective and co-create so this works, this works even better. And that meeting became a very successful meeting and it led to an easy acquisition and tra- and and working relationship between the two companies. So transparency. We're gonna all need these, these tools going forward. Yeah. Know, the whole country is going through major change at this point. Well, you can look, how do we build trust? You can see it. You can see, oh, I won't go into politics, but you can see who you trust when they talk and who you don't trust. I mean, you pick it up, you pick it up very, very quickly. Yeah. And so so let, me, let me just uh, uh, show your book. Oh, okay. I don't have it. But yeah, Richard didn't have one, but on, well, uh, on the Creating We website, you can get a, you can order a copy of uh, uh, Conversational Intelligence. You can buy it on Amazon as well. Okay. Well, it's important that it's available it's everywhere. Thing. If you're interested in the topic, and I hope you are, on our website are many interviews that Judy did uh, with key scientists and with other people. Um, there are blogs. Judy was interviewed in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and so on. Judith was ranked as one of the top 10 leader consultants by independent agencies, not people mm-hmm. you pay. Um, by, she was mentioned in Forbes. Uh, conversational intelligence was considered one of the major, major innovative books in leadership. Um, it, was, it was featured in Forbes. It was featured in Fortune and so on. But there's a whole host of information on the creatingwe.com website. And the one, in, and, and she had a big interview with um, Fran Tarkington. And it's fascinating wow. because Tarkington was so interested in conversational intelligence. To be, he has a major business that works with small companies. And okay. he was so interested in it. We were, we were down in Atlanta and for three hours, they talked as if they were buddies forever. And there, it's in three segments and it's in there and it's a very inf- informative series of interviews. But everything is there, the blogs and copies. And we also, on the more, on the more psychological side, publish a blog almost every month 
in psychology today. And so you can learn a little bit about um, the psychological or the neuroscience aspects of what we do by lo looking at those blogs. So we should point out that the, the uh, uh, interviews that are on your website are available at no charge. Yes. This is important for financial people. Okay. <laughs> You're the ones who invented the number two pencil extender, you know. You're right. So we no, there's no charge. I can make 11 cents. They're freebies. Um, yeah. So. It, Judy was much more area. It's free, but it's worth every penny. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, there's a really fascinating interview with Rex Jung on innovation and how the brain works in innovation and mm -hmm. how what happens to the brain in innovation. Um, uh, Joy Hirsch at Yale um, talks about, and she's one of these people put electrodes all over your head mm -hmm. and measures what happens in your brain. And her comment to Judy in that interview was, I published my papers in scientific journals, but you have the ability to explain what I'm trying to say to everyone. Yeah. So fascinating interview. I, uh, I think part of the discussion, what, that I, one of the things I found most interesting was the boss got up and listed his 10 faults. Right. How often does that happen? Very rarely. And, and that made people bring the conversation, I assume, to a level three conversation. It does. And I, I, one other thing that they did, we have an exercise that we would do. First of all, everybody's at round tables. Nobody's at square tables. And wow. we said to everybody, look, at your table, everyone write down what success means to you. So everybody at the table is like eight people at a table. And everybody writes down what success means to you. And after about 15 minutes or so, we say, okay, how many people at the table had the same definition of success? Raise your hand. And you're, it's amazing, nobody raised their hand. Everybody has a different understanding. Words create worlds. And so you have to be right. really, you know, to, you have to understand that our concepts of what we hear may be so much different than what somebody is saying to us. Right. We, we won't mention who, but words have meaning. There words are people in this world, sadly, who don't understand that. Yeah. Uh, Peggy's uh, theme song is um, only 7% uh, of what you're communicating is your, are your words. Uh, one of the things I say is email has no tone. People have to understand that when they're emailing, there's no spin. It's not like we're sitting here now talking and having well, a conversation. Right. Actually, I'm going to add two things to that. One, to me, it's very important. And I, I say it's more than what you say. It's how you say it, whether it's your choice of words. I knew I got or, that wrong. Or whether it's your body language. That's really important. And I know that you always say email has no tone. Tone. And right. It can and be read I, different ways. And I say to you, email has a lot of tone. The problem is the tone of an email is in the mind of the reader rather than in the mind of the person. Because we don't know what, when you get that email, we don't know what was in the other person's mind. We can only see the words. But when we read it, we put our own spin on it. So as a writer, we have to be careful not to use words that will then cause that negative tone or that negative um, feeling. All right, so we've run over 10 minutes. I try to honor mm -hmm. my commitment, but uh, we we're having such an interesting, and we've gotten rave reviews in the chat. So that's very, all nice. very time cool. worthwhile. Uh, tomorrow's chat with Matt. I'm going to take over the screen. Richard, thank you so much. My pleasure. I have a I question. I've really been enjoying this. Michael, do I know you? <laughs> Michael, is it Michael Nadler? Well, I, I, I don't I, think so. I, I wanted to end with uh, my, my, my grandmother uh, was born in Russia, and uh, she had no shame about her writing. So she would, uh, she would write everything phonetically, and she had a very thick Russian accent. So what she said was, well, when you get a letter from me, you have to read it out loud. And it was just so true. If you yeah. didn't read it out loud, you couldn't figure out what she was saying. Very uh, so tomorrow's chat with Matt is with uh, Brad Hughes, who is one of our founding great grandfathers. And then we're <laughs> gonna do a special uh, chat with Matt on Friday about change, which is exactly what we're all going through right now. 
<laughs> uh, to a degree unimaginable in uh, human history. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I thank everybody for their participation. We're trying to make these chats with Matt very personal, and uh, and uh, so far we've been successful in doing that. Uh, and I look forward to uh, more opportunities to for those of you who have not met me personally to actually see me on the screen. And I usually have shorter hair. I haven't had a haircut since uh, the middle of February, but uh, that's all part of the coronavirus thing. Uh, I'm on strike until uh, they solve this thing. So. Peggy, did you have a closing comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say, Rich, thank you so much. But that when I read a lot of the comments in the, the chat, when people were leaving and saying thank you, everybody or a lot of people were saying this was excellent. That it, you know, it, a lot of times we would just say thanks. And they said it was excellent, a really good conversation. So thank you for sharing uh, your knowledge on this subject and Judith's knowledge with all of us. I think everybody is going to be... Tell them to put that in a memo form, you know? So, <laughs> okay. having a great conversation. So it thank you. It was a great conversation. Thank all you. Right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sadly end the meeting. Okay. And, uh, I wish all of you well and, uh, and, and that all of you have learned a little bit about how to have uh, a great conversation. So, Richard, thank again, you. thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be your friend. So God bless. Bye-bye.